Hi, I'm Chris Caligari. Welcome to Ultimate Wildlife Gardens. Today I want to talk a little bit about grasslands and wildflower meadows. Now before you start thinking, oh yes, we've heard it all before, my take is likely to be rather different to the general run of television programmes and channels. My uh, take is based on experience, hard years of experience as the wrinkles will indicate. Behind me you can see a mowed path and this is mowed about once a week. To the sides mowed very infrequently. Now if we look down at the closely mowed area, relatively closely mowed area, the biodiversity is really rather low. Okay, we've got plenty of shortish grass, clover, plantain, dandelion, uh, a little bit of thistle, a bit of daisy. What should we say? Half a dozen species, maybe something like that. If we start delving into it, then we're likely to find that all forms of life are fairly limited. Oh, I've got some background noise there with the robin singing, which was rather nice. A minute ago I could also hear the wren giving an alarm call because one of my cats is close by. Anyway, I diverge. If we look into the paths, uh, to the sides of the paths, then in the longer grass, it's a whole different ball game. It doesn't look, you, you're probably not going to say, oh wow, isn't, doesn't that look wonderful and colourful. But that really is my point. At the moment, we're in autumn. There's not very much in the way of wildflowers, but there will be an awful lot in the way of life. So into the side, into the longer material, we've got thistles, We've got geranium, uh, herb robert, uh, we've got field geranium, I can see there uh, we have a few nettles creeping in. We have an awful lot more species, but the point that I really want to make is the fact that it's longer makes it so much more valuable, because beneath that grass is where lots and lots of animals can live. We're talking the mini beasts, we're talking all sorts of things, but also during the season, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, and lots and lots of invertebrates. Really, short grass, relatively speaking, is a desert. If we grade it up, we'd say astroturf, tarmac, gravel, that scores a zero. You've got to be joking, that's taking the P155. I'd give it that. You've got to be joking. Next up would be a bowling green, putting green, very short, well-tended grass. That is also scores virtually a zero on the wildlife scale. A normal domestic lawn I wouldn't say it's a wildlife desert, I wouldn't say it's a zero, but it's getting a bit damn close to it. Yeah, I'd give that a one king fair. It's not that good, but it's okay. In my area, and I'm sure it's true in your area as well, many people have land and it's virtually automatic to cover most of it with short grass. Now for wildlife, that really is a disaster. In the particular area I live, many people uh, have reached a stage in life where they can afford a bit more land. They think, oh yes, nice lot of space, great, bigger garden. But in reality, they haven't got a clue what to do with it. So most of it gets put down to lawn, which is pretty devastating for wildlife. Now I'm saying that it's not popular to do so, but it's the truth and I'm on here to tell the truth. I don't have to plug any sort of business or anything else. I speak purely and my experience of wildlife.
So, in the countryside, there's an awful lot of grass. But is it the right sort of grass? Answer, no. My house has a view of many fields, and every single one of those uh, fields is used to produce grass. You might say, well, grass, that's longer grass for hay or silage. That's good, isn't it? I'm afraid not. Uh, in fact, they all produce uh, silage, and it's cut far too early for it to be beneficial for wildlife. I don't say it scores a zero, but it's nothing like as valuable as it could be. This is where we come in with our ultimate wildlife gardens. So the spaces that we have that we do not mow, and the fact that you're watching this, uh, this video means that you are. You have either decided to not mow or you're thinking about it, and that's absolutely great because mowing really kills wildlife. Now I know it sounds a bit perverse, but this area behind me is quite a good example. It is autumn time, there's not much flower colour anyway, but it is distinctly scrubby. Now that classically is not a very beautiful garden, but as far as wildlife is concerned, it is the most gorgeous garden. And that is absolutely, wildlife absolutely thrives in there. Now, on the thumbnail, you may have seen me with that. This is shampoo. And really, I think grassland is a bit the same. If I'd been brought up, as I was, to always use shampoo, I surely reach a point when I say, hmm, Possibly shampoo isn't necessary. I think possibly it's the same with mowed grasslands. I think we've reached a point where we can say, do we really need to totally eliminate or virtually eliminate wildlife from a space? Because that's the way we've brought up, been brought up to say that it is tidy. And for a space like this to be considered untidy. Now this space, I know because I live with it, is absolutely brimming with wildlife. It isn't only the flowers. And this is the point I really want to make. That if you stop mowing, the flowers will come. There will be things like dandelions and daisies and buttercups and all sorts of things. Those, they, you will get flowers and you will get nectar and pollen feeders, very glad of it. But really, most channels, I think, and programs, television programs, they miss the main point that the value in not mowing isn't really for, from the flowers. That's a nice bonus, but the real value is spaces like this. This is where myriads of uh, little mini beasts can live. This is where slow worms can live. This is where uh, the mice can live. Just down the way from me here, I've got uh, an ivy coloured, uh, ivy covered maple in which tawny owls roost, some of the time anyway. Whether they're in there at the moment, I don't know. And I've seen them feeding in this area. I've got some mowed areas because I've got two rescue dogs and I need to chase a ball. But quite a lot of it is scrubby like this. And this is absolutely wonderful for the small mammals. And if we want owls, if we want kestrels, if we want birds of prey, if we want slow worms, if we want the rich biodiverse habitat environment, then we need to provide these sort of habitats. Without it, we're sanitising our land, our gardens, our open spaces, our churchyards, etc. Now when I walk around this area, 
the area where I live, and I know very well it's going to be the same where you live. Perhaps you can hear the uh, pheasants there, our young pheasants, as you might have heard about in other videos. Um, if, if I walk around my area, and I'm sure it's the same for yours, you will find vast areas which are mowed, where wildlife is being excluded from. Uh, one particular piece of land is, uh, they've bought it fairly recently. It is an area of, I would think, about three or four acres. And I don't think they honestly know what to do with it. They've got a ride on mower and they mow it. For why? I've no idea. Uh, there are verges on country lanes, which, which again are mowed for tidiness sake. This surely is wrong. Right, so now I'll change position. Let's talk about establishing what should be there for wildlife. So, we know that the benefits to wildlife of not mowing are considerable. Whether or not we have a lot of wildflowers in that area is something else. If we have a lot of wildflowers, then that further increases the biodiversity and so much the better. So let's talk about establishing them. There are no rules. That's rule number one. There are no rules. And there are all sorts of possibilities. Don't worry about classic ideas. The famous, the favourite photo shots of wonderful idyllic meadows covered with flowers. You may want to achieve that. You may succeed. It doesn't really matter. So don't don't have an idea in your mind necessarily, which is set of how you want it to end up. The fact that you've stopped mowing, you're halfway there. The easiest place situation to establish a wildflower and or grassland is from a lawn because the soil will already probably be fairly impoverished which is great um, because it gives the wildflowers a, a chance to get established and the more aggressive grasses aren't favoured by the low fertility and so the wildflowers will tend not to be overrun. So in the case of a lawn it's simply a case of letting it grow. Uh, possibly mowing can help. If you start to get too many broad-leaved weeds in it, weeds, I say wild plants, plants that you don't want, and I'm thinking particularly of things like docks and nettles, then you might want to give it an occasional mow, only a few times, and with the mower set very high, because their growing tips are quite high, if you keep cutting them off, they won't continue to, to come back and you will in fact eliminate them. If you want to encourage further, so if you just let the lawn grow, a lot of wildflowers will be there already and they will come. Things like the clovers, the dandelions, the daisies, the plantains, there'll be quite a lot already in there. And to enrich it, either grow from seed or by plugs of the wildflowers that you want be it red campion, white campion, geraniums, whatever there's a vast selection. Don't worry if you don't get it exactly right because nature being what it is if you've put the right plant in and the conditions are right it will thrive. If you put the wrong plant in it will die out. Natural selection in action that's fine. I would recommend that you don't, you, you can seed and if you're going to seed now is the time during the autumn so that the seeds, some will have a vernalization requirement, they'll need a cold spell to break the dormancy so it's a good idea, in fact it's the ideal time to plant wildflower seeds now in the autumn and let them go through the winter. In a lawn, if you're going to use, uh, if you're going to plant seed, I'd recommend scratching the grass in some areas 
with something like this, which is a springtime rake or a plastic version of the same thing like this um, it just creates some spaces and you can expose a little bit of soil and you can work the seed into that you don't have to worry about planting the whole lot just some patches are fine because the name of the game really is to supply the propagules so if you just get half a dozen plants coming up growing they'll set stacks of seed more than sufficient so you only want to establish little colonies you can on the other hand buy plugs and I would recommend for planting out to establish your meadowland to grow these on in pots and get them to a good size get them to a few inches high then scratch a little bit of a patch so you eliminate a bit of competition for them plant them in the trout simply dig a hole plant them in a bit of water nurture them it's only to get them established once they're established and they're breeding you're away if you want to establish your wildflower area in an area of roughish pasture or some sort of grass which is a little bit grown beyond a lawn that's absolutely fine um, I would not recommend digging really you you it can be done to establish um, a little sort of seed bed but really what tends to happen if you dig a disturbed bit of pasture is that you get a lot of pioneering plants and you get a lot of things that you don't actually want so therefore I would concentrate on initially mowing it uh, with the dreaded mower but that's only give it a few cuts and collect the cuttings if possible to take them off to lower the nutrient status of that piece of ground if you can do it for the season that's absolutely fine you'll then mow out a lot of the more aggressive species particularly the broad leaf species keep mowing it for a season and then go for establishing your wildflower meadow again I would probably the choice would be yours but I would probably go for planting uh, individual plants in there which you can raise yourself from seeds by plugs get them to a good healthy size and concentrate as my usual practice is to try and get a breeding in breeding individuals which will seed down if the conditions are right they'll look after themselves from there on I wouldn't in I've I found in general that I don't uh, try and produce a wildflower garden through digging I find it's often counterproductive it's an awful lot of work and often doesn't work very well I'm sure you know what ecological succession is so if you plant if you disturb the soil you're going to get pioneer species and then other species will come in and take over and it will gradually evolve in the right direction but if you've got an established sward already I try and work with that it's it's quicker you get better results it's it's just a win-win situation management thereafter right now once you've got your wildflower area grassland call it as you will how do you look after it well there are lots of possibilities and with a wildlife garden what I'm always aiming to do is to produce a great deal of variability and a lot of habitat diversity so in some situations you might allow your wildflowers to grow set seed and classically speaking not before the end of July sometime in August you'd probably cut it back let the cut material lie there for a while to make sure that all the seed has gone back into the soil then rake off that's great it works well yeah that's a step in the right direction I'd give that two king good yeah, two king good, moving in the right direction. Uh, I like that.
Is it the answer? No. That's one strategy. But it's also a good idea, if you have enough space, not to cut until much later, perhaps even in the spring. The reason for that, there's an awful lot of creatures that will be overwintering in the grass. Now, not a lot of people realise that many of our butterflies actually feed on grass. So, sort of old school would be, well, yes, you provide lots of flowers to produce nectar, so the butterflies can come in and feed and that'll be good for them. Yes, it is good for them. Is it enough for me, for us, Ultimate Wildlife Gardens? I'd say no. Behind me, you might be able to make out, I've got some nettles, essential for many species of butterflies. But, but the, I suppose probably fewer people appreciate the value of grasses. And particularly, well, in this particular situation, skipper butterflies, meadow browns, ringlets, gatekeepers, many species, I've heard a figure of 20%, of the species in Great Britain feed on grasses. So the grass needs to be allowed to grow long. That's where they'll lay their eggs. Overwintering, most of those species, I think all of those species, but I'm not a lepidopterist, uh, overwinter in the long grass. So therefore, there's a great deal of virtue in not cutting it, or certainly not raking it clean until later on in the year. So, and there are many creatures that will be very glad to spend the winter in the bottom of the grass. Also in the long grass, mice, for example, frequently build nests. So if you have, you don't have your classic hay meadow type vegetation, but instead you have something as I showed you a little bit earlier on, where it's a bit tussocky, a bit clumpy, that too is great in its own way. So the fact that you have the long vegetation, that's what you want. That's the vital thing. If it's full of flowers, nice if, if it is. If it isn't, it's still of immense value. Yeah, now we're starting to get somewhere. I'm going to give that three king good. Yeah. So it's really ideal, if you have enough space, I try and have some areas which I will cut the, uh, cut the vegetation off and rake off. Some areas where I will leave until spring before I cut and rake off. And some areas, like the one I showed you on the previous location, I will tend to leave permanently. That's, that's for several reasons, but in that patch I have ant hills, and they take quite a long time to get established and I'm very fond of those. The marble whites, uh, butterflies, I've seen an egg laying in there, uh, and so the caterpillars will have developed, it will be overwintering in there, and I'm quite happy to leave that alone. I don't want it to go too scrubby, so some years I will possibly cut it, but the, the, what I'm basically driving at is if you can rotate and leave some areas for longer period than others, and you're creating a load of habitat diversity, and uh, you, will, you will get the variety of species as a result. Now we've got there, I'm going to give that forking excellent. Well done, that's the pinnacle. That's where we're aiming for. Forking excellent. Now the last topic I want to deal with is the actual business of cutting. Um, there's a wide number of, of ways you can do it. If you're young enough, fit enough, aggressive enough and the air isn't too big, then obviously it's ideal if you can do it with either a, a hook or a pair of clippers. Um, no fossil fuels involved, no noise, great, but not easy to do. I have in several of my past 
uh, wildlife areas, or I've had quite a large area of hay meadowy type habitat. I've had a scissor bar cutter as an alternative to a mower, which is is excellent because it cuts the grass and vegetation off cleanly. It doesn't chop it up. So therefore you can cut it, leave it for a few days to dry, rake it up and then put it on your your heap, your natural compost heap, which creates another fantastic environment for your grass snakes, your small mammals, for your slow worms, all sorts of things to live in, stacks of mini beasts. So that's the great thing to do with your cut material. So a scissor bar cutter powered is a pretty useful thing. Many people, including myself in this situation, use a strimmer. I use it very carefully um, and I trample through where I'm going to cut first of all to try and make sure I drive everything out. And of course they're fairly noisy machines. I don't move them that quickly um, because of the nature of the vegetation. And you can cut the vegetation off fairly cleanly, rake it off, and they do a pretty good job. But, but however much, however, whatever method you use, uh, if it's a machine, you'll be using a lot less fossil fuels than with a conventional mower. I hope you found this useful. If you have, I'd be most grateful if you would press the like button. I'd be grateful if you subscribe to the channel. That helps. Uh, I only do this for the benefit of wildlife. I have no backers, um, no sponsors. So if you do find it useful, I would be most grateful if you would subscribe. And particularly, the more people that we can encourage to wildlife garden, the better for wildlife. And at the end of the day, that's all I want. Well, I think it's probably all you want as well. If you could share it, I'd be most grateful. Thanks ever so much for watching, and I hope to see you on the next video. Thank you. Bye.